The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Salmon are one of the most magnificent species that you rarely get to see, especially when they go to sea. The migratory route from freshwater to open ocean expanse of the Gulf of Alaska and then back again is unparalleled. No other species travels these great distances without an overhead view. Salmon travel to and from their spawning grounds guided by some internal sonar that is remarkably precise. Jason Wong says they swim thousands of kilometers and return to the exact same spot. We still don't fully understand how they do it. It is truly remarkable. Over the past 100 years, their numbers have been devastated. We know many of the reasons why. Spawning ground disruption or destruction, coastal eelgrass depletion, predators, and the science also points to impacts from open pen fish farms. Then there is the mystery of what happens when they head out to the open ocean. Add in changing climate and the impact uh, is devastating on some BC salmon populations, uh, but not all. It's remarkable that some populations are actually showing signs of great resilience. It's impressive how salmon are able to adapt. It's also important to note that they need us to make responsible choices about their habitat. I invited Jason Wong, the Vice President of Salmon at the Pacific Salmon Foundation, to join me for a conversation that matters about the state of salmon in BC. Jason, is that a fair assessment of where we're at? Like, it, there's some good news, and, but there's also some troubling news. Yeah, Sue, I think you summarized that really nicely. And one of the things that it, it does take a little bit of thinking to unravel is that uh, we do have a, a large number of salmon populations in BC that are in serious decline, and some of them are, are on the verge of, of major conservation uh, uh, concern, mm -hmm. you know, that their future existence is in jeopardy. But in that mix, we have other populations that are doing reasonably well, and we have some populations that are even rebuilding and recovering. And uh, it, it, there's no single story that you can say, you know, put a blanket over that says, here's, you know, in one sentence or two, the story of salmon in British Columbia. It's really a, a, a variable um, uh, kind of... Uh, you know, a smorgasbord of different things, but you know the thing that we're worried about are the populations that are in decline, especially because the decline has been ongoing, and with uh, all of the factors that, that you were touching on in your intro, uh, really uh, so many things working against them that you know we need to start really focusing on that and see how many of those we can start turning more in favor of salmon for the future. Is it certain geographical areas that we see populations being affected by? Or is there a mix? Like within one geographic zone, there may be one population that is finding a way to adapt and another that maybe isn't. Uh, I could probably give you two answers to that. <laughs> uh, both of those statements, I'd say, are true in a way. On one hand, w one of the things that the, uh, the science and monitoring are showing is that Salmon that spend more time in fresh water are generally doing more poorly than salmon that spend less time in fresh water. And, and mm -hmm. salmon populations that um, are more northerly in their distribution are doing better than salmon populations that are more southerly in British Columbia. But at the same time, you can take uh, salmon populations in a geographic area and still dissect that further and say, where I live in the Kamloops area, there's a population of Chinook salmon that spawn in the South Thompson River. That's one of the strongest of Fraser River Chinook populations present day. They, they've been performing quite well. The run size has actually increased over the last uh, decade or so. But right in the same vicinity, other Chinook populations that have a, a different life history are some of the ones that have been identified as at risk. It's hard to tell the difference, though, of uh, what that life history is, especially when they come from similar geographic regions, mm -hmm. and out to sea they go. Uh, how do you find out what, what were the factors? Well, using those Chinook uh, as, as an example, uh, it, it kind of goes back to some of my answer to your question. The South Thompson population probably have two things that are working in their favor. 
One is, if you know the South Thompson River, it's fed by the Shuswap Lake System. It's a fairly large river, and with those lake systems that they had, uh, the summertime and fall flows are stable, the water is very clean, the gravel in the river is very clean. So they've got a habitat uh, that they use that's kind of buffered from climate change effects and from human development effects. But the Chinook salmon, oh, and then the other thing that's going for them is this particular population from the interior uh, does something different than a lot of other interior Chinook populations in that they only stay in that river after they hatch for about 60 to 90 days. So they go to sea fairly early uh, for a Chinook population. Hmm. Other Chinook populations in the same area, they have a different life history. They spawn in the smaller streams. Those smaller streams tend to be more affected by human development activity. They're more affected by climate change effects like drought. They're under more pressure when there is a drought for you know, the, the competing priorities of the environment and human use for water. And those fish actually spend a whole year in fresh water before they go to sea. So the South Thompson population, they kind of leave the interior say before the drought usually hits and before you have super high water temperatures and they're in a place that they would be buffered anyway so their hmm. uh, the the diversity of salmon has given them a winning card or a winning hand you know in the poker game of of resiliency but the uh the populations yeah. that are almost right beside them that have a life history to adapt to the smaller streams are doing really poorly in, in the, the current days you know poker game of survival I gotta get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. That almost sounds counterintuitive to me because I'm thinking that you're a small, you know, uh, smolt becoming a salmon. You stay close to home, you're protected, that you would think that, you, that, you know, you would do better. But you're actually saying, nope, get out, get out there. Even though I would think that they uh, could fall victim to predators that are down along the coast. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the remarkable things about the diversity of salmon and the resiliency is that diversity uh, gives salmon overall uh, a real insurance policy against all the different things that the environment and uh, and their their ecosystem will throw at them. So you know, the way I look at it is salmon have kind of evolved to occupy all of the niches of the accessible habitat in BC. There's a population that's ideally suited for every stream and watershed, uh, lake and river that they can get to. And in uh, the course of, uh, you know, even before humans uh, started causing major changes to the landscape, just natural variability in climate and environment, you know, landslides are natural, forest fires are natural. Uh, there, there would have been times when some salmon populations would have been hit by something, but there would have been other populations in the area that would have survived. And then, uh, you know, as say the effect of a landslide mitigated, there would have been salmon populations to repopulate that area. Mm -hmm. And so there's a natural side to that, but then humans have kind of stepped on the gas pedal of some of these things that uh, would happen naturally. And then we've introduced even new things to what would happen naturally. So we're there's a cascade of things that are working against salmon populations. So there are some that are doing okay, but uh, you know, I would say uh, there are many, many populations that are really suffering the effects of all of the things that humans have done on their landscape and to their ecosystem. Are we getting better at not doing the wrong things? In some cases, yes, but we seem to be really good at replacing that with other things that are gonna bring in a new problem. And, I, I do think the current state of salmon and, and the number of problematic populations is catching people's attention. People are seeing that. Uh, PSF did a survey uh, recently that showed, I think it was 86% of uh, British Columbians rate salmon and the, the current state of decline as their number one environmental concern right now, even above the overall effects of climate change. They kind of focus that on salmon because British Columbians care about salmon. It's part of our culture, whether you're a First Nations person, uh, somebody that has arrived, you know, in more recent times, uh, people here care. <coughs> and so they're getting attention, 
but I don't think we have turned the corner where I could say I think we're on the right track overall and I see things, I'm confident that things will be better in the future. I know they could be, but I'm not sure we've arrived um, you know, on, that, on mm -hmm. that track yet to say we're, we're doing everything the right way. We've still got a lot of stuff we have to get a handle on. How uh, severe was the impact from that extraordinary weather event that started at the beginning of July and we didn't see precipitation for more than three, almost three and a half months? Um, yeah. Uh, that's Mother Nature, but then how is it also compounded by human behavior? Well, I, I would just qualify that a little bit to say it was Mother Nature, it was human behavior, and then the climate change effect of all of our, our you know, cumulative totality of human behavior all coming together. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, e events like that can occur in the natural cycle of things. But what the climate scientists are telling us is they're going to be worse, they're going to be more severe, and they're going to come more frequently than they w ever would have. Uh, without the effects of, of what humans have done to the, mm -hmm. to the kind of global climate cycle. Uh, but when you bring that home locally, it, there were all kinds of things that, that uh, transmitted to effects to salmon. There were, um, we went from very high water, because if you remember the spring, the spring was cold, right? Very cold. And col yeah. Colder than usual, snow melt came late. So we had really high water, in, especially in watersheds that are, are drained from the interior of British Columbia where the snowpack builds up. We had high water and high water going way late into the season compared to what I would say average. Mm -hmm. And then we went from that to it not raining, as you said, for a long time. So we had uh, some effects from that high water uh, where salmon were not able to get back Just to their spawning the grounds. The water, was the, 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 <laughs> too, the water was too high in the Fraser River for the earliest time sockeye populations to get home, and they died en route, and we, we can talk about that in a bit. But then, specific to your question about you know, the, the, the summer and fall drought, we were seeing things like salmon um, not being able to get into their spawning streams because, say, on east coast of Vancouver Island, the flows were so low that salmon were holding uh, off the stream mouth. And that's a natural thing, but it went way later into the year than you would expect them to, uh, to normally have to hold. Uh, we saw salmon doing similar things even in delaying their migrations to some of the interior streams. Like where I live uh, in Kamloops, the Adams River is a very famous sockeye river. And the sockeye did arrive there. They, they arrived in smaller numbers, I think, than people were hoping, but they also came late. And there's a whole series of cascading effects when salmon get somewhere later than they're ideally uh, evolved to, uh, to, 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 spawn? To, to their timing. Yeah. Um, like, and I'll just give, give you a simple example. When, those, the, 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 when salmon lay their eggs, that is kind of a, a, the start of a clock. And so the eggs you know, incubate in the gravel for a certain amount of time, and then the juveniles hatch, and then the juveniles will, if, in the case of sockeye, swim down to the lake, and then they'll spend a year in the lake. But in the evolution of salmon, all of that is timed perfectly to have the juveniles arrive in the lake just as the spring sun and heat are hitting the lake. And because what that does is it starts up the food web cycle. It starts growing algae in the lake and then aquatic invertebrates eat the algae and that's what the sockeye eat. So if the sockeye uh, fry arrive in the lake either too early, then that food supply isn't ready for them yet. Or if they come too late, they either might miss that match of, of uh, hitting their food supply or something else might get it. So when you change the timing, even mm -hmm. though, okay, the sockeye showed up, like, yeah, they're two weeks late, so what? That two weeks late on arriving to spawn could mean they're two weeks late in coming out of the gravel, which means they're two weeks late to hit the food supply in the lake when, Did they, when they were. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole series of cascading effects wow. when you get a change like that that comes from, from that kind of, of you know, extraordinary uh, drought and, and, and weather pattern and climate pattern. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. 
there are, I, I guess, two different ways of looking at, well, what can we do about that? Uh, there's no doubt uh, there is a concerted effort by people to say, yes, we have to change the way that we are to mitigate the impacts uh, upon climate. But in the day-to-day, -day, like this week, next month, next year, what else can we do then to help ensure that those salmon get to that spot mm -hmm. at the right time? Well, you know, I appreciate that question. And uh, there are so many things we can do. And, and that's a message I think it's important to leave people with. Because if you were to follow my narrative, you'd sort of think, well, you know, what yeah. do we do? Give up. Right. right. But that's not the case. And that's not the point that I would want people to take away from this thread of conversation. I think you can start to uh, look at, okay, what are the things that are causing problems for salmon? How have human activities at the local scale um, caused effects to that? And what can we mitigate or undo? So I'll give you a couple of examples. One thing, uh, drought and dry weather patterns are normal in, in a non-human affected uh, ecosystem or watershed. The watersheds tend to be buffered from those kinds of effects in, in terms of uh, how they benefit salmon in really simple ways. Uh, uh, one example would be, um, we've all seen beaver ponds. We know beavers can build a dam and then there's a big pond there. Well, what does that do if you're a salmon? Well, just imagine there's a drought and if that beaver pond is there, you've got stored water and that water's gonna kind of leak out through and around the dam and you're going to have base flow there that wouldn't be there if that beaver dam wasn't there right? mm -hmm. because that water would have just run down the stream you know during the spring and summer and then by late summer fall there'd be no water so in a natural ecosystem there would be beavers all over the place wherever they can find food and make a house mm -hmm. and they, they naturally store water right and so they are naturally uh, making that watershed more resilient to the effects of a drought and what have we done in our human development? Well, we've developed the, the valley bottoms, we've developed the floodplains, we've eradicated beavers from a lot of the landscape. And in some places, you could let beavers come back. Now, that might be hard where we've got agriculture or urban landscapes or whatever, but we can do things, we can copy what beavers did. Huh. There are places uh, in uh, the Northwest United States that are building these things called beaver dam analogs. It's essentially a man-made thing that's kind of like a beaver dam that will hold some of the water back. That You do it in places where it won't have a negative effect on uh, kind Overall of essential, yeah. essential human yeah. activities, but it provides some resiliency to that watershed. And there are groups here in British Columbia that are looking at bringing that method here, saying, let's go start doing that. It's a relatively simple thing. It does cost some money and it's some labor and it's not going to fix the problem all by itself. But, you know, you take these things where we've done something to make things worse for salmon. Right. If we do that, we're kind of pushing that equilibrium more in the direction of more in favor for salmon. So that's a relatively simple thing. It's, it's sticks and stones in the right place in a creek and you do it over and over again and you start to store some water in a way that mimics what nature in a natural ecosystem would have done and will in turn have a benefit to salmon if we have another year like we had this year. So what about hatchery programs? Um, you know, it was a big part of our, you know, effort to help to preserve salmon going back over a number of decades. What role are they playing right now? Do you see an expansion of that? Mm. Or where, do, where does that take us? Well, we, we could probably spend a week talking about hatcheries. My, my, my sound bite for hatcheries is that they're misunderstood for the most part by the general public and even by some people that care deeply about their salmon. I think the history of hatcheries in British Columbia when say the salmon enhancement program which started in the, the mid to late 70s in a, in a big way, was, uh, if you think about it, in a time when ocean productivity for salmon was really high. Uh, if we would get 20% survival, say, from a, yeah. a coho population on, on Vancouver Island. And if we put more salmon out from a hatchery, we got a lot more salmon coming back. Uh, ocean productivity has changed, you know, climate change drivers and other things. Now you're getting 2% or 1% or less than 1% survival. So hatcheries aren't able to do the same thing they were doing. And also back in the day, I don't think we had the same appreciation for the genetic diversity of salmon that we have now. Mm -hmm. And you know, re reflecting back earlier in the conversation, not every Chinook is the same, right? I was talking about some Chinook that are right now, they've got the winning poker hand and mm -hmm. some Chinook don't. And if 
we maybe didn't think all that through or know all that back in the early days of hatcheries. So we were going to populations where the populations were pretty big, where you had uh, right conditions to build a hatchery and making fish. And for the most part, you got a return on that. So if you carry forward to today, what do we know now? We know that hatcheries uh, can be quite positive. They can help um, sustain populations when they're in trouble. And we can look at that uh, big bar landslide from 2019 when salmon could not get past that spot in the Fraser River. And there are very, very important salmon populations that need to get past there. So that hatchery option was a really good way to ensure that the, the, uh, the fish from those populations had, we had the opportunity to save their eggs, to spawn them in a hatchery. So we know there'll be at least a few of those fish that are able to continue that biological line. But on the other hand, we also know that hatcheries can have negative effects. It can do things like overwhelm the natural genetic diversity of a river. It can do things like have unintended consequences. Uh, as an example, if you, your hatchery is um, uh, producing a lot of fish and then we go fishing for those fish in the hatchery, you're also catching fish that migrate at the same time that might not be from a stream with a hatchery on it. And if that happens to be a population that's in trouble, you know, you might be catching some of those fish that are in trouble while you fish for your hatchery population. So, you know, when, why I say they're misunderstood is right now I would summarize the hatchery debate of there are some people that think hatcheries are the way to solve problems. And um, there are some people right now that are so concerned about the state of their salmon. They are pushing government and others really hard just to hurry up and build a hatchery in their territory. And I, when people ask me about that, I say hatcheries can help but slow down. Come up with a plan, figure out where hatcheries fit in your overall strategy to rebuild and recover salmon. If you do it right, there's a good chance it can help. And then there's the other side of the conversation where people have become aware of the negative side of hatcheries. And some people are saying, stop that, right? There, there's no argument to continue hatcheries. Pretty much everything that they do is either temporary or negative, And we don't think we should have them. I'm right in the middle of that. Yeah. Hatcheries done the right way uh, with, with thoughtful management and thoughtful assessment can be a very positive contribution to future salmon sustainability. But hatcheries done without thinking all that through can have unintended negative effects. So it's about, it's like a lot of things, right? Like things that uh, are, are tricky in our society, we go to experts and say, you know, you wouldn't ask me to build you a bridge over the Fraser River. I don't know anything about building bridges. I can drive on a bridge. I would never build a bridge. And hatcheries are the same. Like hatcheries are not, really something anybody can it's not hard to make a fish in a hatchery you need some water you need some eggs and, and you need some trays to put the eggs in but what's really hard is knowing which fish do you make how many do you make how does making those fish interact with the fish in the natural ecosystem and how is it all going to work out to get us to meet the objective we want third and final break we'll be right back the production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. We've already burned through our time, <laughs> but you leave me with the sense that we are in a much better position to be able to do all we can to help this remarkable species that finds ways to adapt and survive. I think there... Uh, how there's a lot being done for salmon right now, but we're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about more money. More money would help, but there is a lot of money on the table right now. But we need to start making more responsible choices. We, we need yeah. to be uh, thinking about, you know, there's this idea in science and resource management about the precautionary approach or the precautionary principle. It says when you have uncertainty, you don't use that as a reason to keep doing something. You take that uncertainty in the face of a conservation issue and say, we probably shouldn't do that unless we are very confident it's not having a negative effect. And we are doing things here in British Columbia right now that we don't have to do. And we're not necessarily taking the most responsible decision that we could on those issues. We're not managing water 
as well as we could to make sure our natural ecosystems have the water in them to sustain salmon populations and to be healthy ecosystems. We can do a lot better with that. We're not managing our land use in our watersheds as effectively as we could to have sustainable developments in economies and also sustain our salmon and aquatic ecosystems. We are doing things in the ocean like open net pen aquaculture that you know the science is saying are high risk transmission sites for pathogens, for sea lice. And there are other ways to do aquaculture that don't put that risk out there on our wild salmon. We need to not just um, have the conversations about those things, we need to take positive action to take these things that we've tilted, you know, against salmon and push them back so they're not working against salmon. And it's within our reach to do that. Well, and thankfully, salmon have you and the Pacific Salmon <laughs> Foundation on their side. Jason, thank you so much. You've given us a glimpse, but you know, I want to encourage anybody who's watching this to go check out what Pacific Salmon Foundation is doing to help support this remarkable species that we get to call our own. Uh, we are blessed. Well, Stu, you know, I think we're very thankful to have you and your interest in this. You've been a great supporter of, of salmon and PSF uh, for all the years I've known you. And I think you know, I appreciate you helping us have these conversations and help people to understand the, the plight of our salmon and to know that it's not hopeless. There's a lot that we can do. And we believe in taking that positive action and solving some of these problems.